I got a little track to go on now. <laughs> Thank you. Um, for some years, uh, the Lord's been putting on my heart for an apostolic training center. And it's called, he gave me the, on the flight up to Canada, the minister there some years ago, he gave me the name for it. He said, uh, you're going to call it Acts, just like the book of Acts, Acts, Apostolic Center for Training Saints, Sons, Sisters, however you want to say it, Apostolic Center for Training Saints. And uh, that's always been in my heart. I love to teach. I love to teach. And I love to show, you know, uh, people how to do it, you know? Uh, and so um, I was just praying on that. This evolved over a long period of time, and I started sharing it with, uh, with uh, Steve Lindo, uh, who was back, a good close friend of mine back in, in uh, Canada, uh, in Colorado. And uh, then wherever I went, I shared it with people up in Canada. I shared it with, you know, uh, people in Brazil when I went down there and uh, other, uh, in other places and nations. And, and uh, they all said, you know, man, we'd like to be a part of that, you know. And uh, so what, what would it be? What would it look like? Well, it, it, it will change. It will evolve into what the Holy Spirit is bringing it to. But essentially what... Uh, uh, well, I'll tell you a little bit of this first. Uh, when I went out to Denver, I was pastoring in, in uh, Su uh, Sioux Falls, South Dakota, and another Christian brother and, uh, asked me to come out to Denver. He had a one-year school, Bible school, in Denver and was teaching and training people. And then he said, I'd like to expand it to a two-year. So he talked to me about it, and we had, in our church, we, had, we affiliated with Apostolic Team Ministry out of Ohio, and they're a small uh, group affiliation of churches. They probably got like 30, 40 churches in the United States and right around uh, 15 to 20 overseas. And uh, so what they had was, uh, what, what you find is a troublesome or a, a difficulty is for people that are feel like they're called into the ministry and you're in the local church. And what do you have to do? You know, well, a lot of people me included, what I had to do is to uproot my family and go for two years to a Bible school. So I lost all my income from that. I had to transition over and try to support my family and my wife and two girls while I was going to Bible college. Well, it's a real struggle. And the, the kids down there, I call them kids, you know, but the young people and older people in the school had to do the same thing. And it's a very, very difficult thing to do. Um, and so uh, they got involved with Vision Christian Bible College, which is out of Florida, and it's affiliated with the uh, 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 University of Florida. And they got them to uh, have an independent school, and they would distribute uh, 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 degrees, bachelor degrees, you know, if you qualify under these so many hours of teaching training. So they did that with ATM, and they had affiliate campuses, small campuses, whoever, like in a church here, who would ever want to come and be a part and go through their year, you know, of, of teaching training, that type of thing. And so I did, we did that uh, uh, Later on, when Al asked me to come out, I said, Al, you know, now we got one year, we got two years, and then the students are gone, and it's not the depth that we need or want to put into them. So then what we did is that we affiliated with Vision Christian Bible College, became an affiliate campus, and now we have a four-year program uh, with them, and you come in and teach and train the people. Now, because we're a small campus, we, we are allowed just mainly for local churches and then whoever else wanted to come in from other churches, and they came and they taught. And so you, you have so many hours you're required to teach per month, you have so much study that you have to do. So a little bit of this apostolic training center, I mean, that was ingrained in me for three, four years, I did that. And so that is a, a prototype of possibly you see, I'm really trying to give me an outdoor on that, but it's a potentially possibly <laughs> a prototype of what would happen. But it would be, if I could, if I could put it in that, in that sense of that timing, we'd have different speakers coming in. 
What, what I realized when I was a pastor, uh, I don't know it all. I don't know it all. I don't flow in certain areas as well as other ministers do. Other uh, traveling prophetic people, apostolic or teachers or things like that. And so where I was weak in subject matter or whatever, I would have other uh, people come in and teach. And they would teach to our, to our church and to the people. And so that's the same principle I see here. You know, uh, yeah, possibly I'd teach some of the courses in this apostolic training to begin with and things like that. And then I would come alongside other people and say, here's our vision. Can you come and be a speaker for us? Can you come and be a teacher? Can you come and be an equipper for us? And then you uh, had come, you got, you uh, tape it, you put it in your uh, library. People from all around the world can access it, right? And there's others that can be an affiliate campus. And then when the, when the timing is right and it works out for finances and all the other things, in, instead of watching somebody on tape, we can send that man, that woman, to that affiliate campus and they can, they can minister to them live. See, and then you rotate. You can rotate that person. Say you have 12 different campuses. Well, once a month he would go to that campus. The next month he'd go here, and the next month he'd go there, there, there. And you just keep rotating. Well, the other speakers that would come, you start rotating them in the same way. And so then what you're doing, the purpose of this is to teach and train the body of Christ to be warriors. Warriors. And so that you are out there, you're on the front lines, you're battling, but you're a warrior and you, you're equipped. How silly would it be to take, our, take troops that say the oath and pledge to the United States and then put them right on the front lines, right? That wouldn't work out very well, would it? So they go through six and maybe more weeks of boot camp training. And that's what I see this will be. And then when you get done with that, then what do you do? You go into specialized training, don't you, to prepare you. And then however many years it takes to get you out there uh, uh, in your career, in your job in the military. My brother was a, a pilot, uh, 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 the F-102s, they called him the Deuce. And he was a pilot and he did the same thing. It was six weeks boot camp and then he went into like another uh, six to 12 weeks of just basic training for piloting. He learned how to fly a plane, of course, and then he went into another one-year program of how to fly the jets, and not only how to fly them, but these were fighter jets. These were not bombers or carriers. These were fighter jets. So he had to learn all that stuff. Well, I can see the same principle working with the church. You get into a boot camp, you get your basic and your foundations, and Vern, Pastor Vern and Pastor Mary have done so much of that. T taught you and trained you in those things. Well, now you need maybe specialized ministry. You know, how to minister this way. Because the message was today, and this is, this is just going like this, the message, it's just like, okay, today was not what I planned, and it's going super, I like it. So the message is today, uh, last Friday, was the message was, who are you? It was a question. Who are you? So I, I tried to explain to you in the Word of God who you were. If you weren't here on Friday, please look at that because that's the whole foundation for today. Who you are. God has called you. He's chosen you. But now you got to fine tune it. Same thing with the purpose. Remember, I just I, I harped on that. I just said it over and over. Do you know your purpose? You know, what is your purpose? Do you know it? You know, one day I believe, this is what the Lord spoke to me, and maybe it's different with you, but I believe one day that when I when I die and I go to heaven, I'm gonna stand before the Lord. The great white throne judgment, what is that all about? That's between the sheep and the goats. Okay? All right, you're one of the sheep. One of the sheep it says, okay, now you go to the judgment seat of Christ. That's where you give an account of all the things that you did in your body while you're here on this earth as a Christian. Right? Okay, so I'm going to stand before the Lord. I believe you're going to stand before the Lord. And I think one of the first questions he's going to ask me, he's going to ask me, what did you do with the gifts that I gave you? I gave you these gifts to equip you. 
What did you do? Well, we know the Great Commission. I mentioned that on Friday. You know, uh, all power and authority has been given over to me. In Matthew 28, Jesus said, he said, now go make disciples. Be a disciple and then make disciples. Okay, well, sometimes we don't have the teaching training. What is it? What is it? What's this? The gifts of the Spirit. How do they function? How do they flow? How do you listen? How do you hear the voice of the Lord? You know, and then act on it, that type of thing. And, and so that's for you. We want you to be taught, trained, equipped. All of it's out there for you. Jesus gave you all of that. You qualify, you qualify for that. He, it, look, look at the uh, ones that it says, you are, you are, you are. If you talk to the sound booth or you talk to Mary and them, you'll see that. You are a royal priesthood. You're called, you're chosen, see? And, and you gotta get that down in your heart. And then you gotta get your eyes off yourself. Because you have to have some spiritual eyes that Jesus would give you so that you can see the hurting people out there. There's hurting people in here today. You gotta be able to see them. You gotta be able to know, what should I say? How can I minister to them? And you have to go to your pastors and say, because you know, and see, uh, uh, what should I do? Sister so-and-so, I just felt when I shook her hand, when I gave her a hug this morning, you know, I just felt this happening. Or uh, brother so-and-so, different things are going through difficulties. You know, the pastors can't do everything. So they have to, they have to lead. They have to lead. Um, uh, do you remember who Stephen was in the scripture? Do you know how he got started? Who said that? You're right. Waiting tables. Acts 6.1, if you could find that scripture, we're weaving in and out of here. We're dive bombing here and we're going over there. And so anyway, Acts 6.1. <laughs> and it says there, it says, look out among you and find seven men. Why, what, what was happening? The disciples, now basically apostles sent, they were helping with the ministering, administering of the food. They were waiting on the people. And, and so it, now they started to get, the people started to murmur, <laughs> complain, whine. Well, we're not getting taken care of. Somebody's not washing my dishes. Who's gonna do all that? Well, then the apostles were there and they said, you know, this isn't right, brothers and sisters. Uh, and then go on to the next one. This is not right, brothers and sisters. We need to go and find uh, some more. It's not reasonable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. That was the apostles. Now go on to the next one. Look out among you and find seven men of honest report. Now, what was the qualifications for these seven men? Honest report, number one, full of the Holy Ghost, and wisdom. That was the qualification for being a waiter or a waitress. That was all guys at that time. A waiter. That's what the qualification was. Honest report, full of the Holy Ghost, full of wisdom. <laughs> Pretty high standards, wasn't it? Pretty high standards. Yeah, go on to the next one. And then so we will give ourselves continually to prayer and the ministry of the word. Okay. Uh, so then what happened to Stephen? Uh, go on to the next one. And it pleased the multitude and then they named him here. Now there's another person here I want you to notice too. Stephen. Full of faith in the Holy Ghost. And then who's the next one? Philip. Philip. And that's, then it's the next one is all those, all right? You got that, right? They're right up there. <laughs> uh, where did they come up with those names? I don't know. Okay, so the main ones I want to focus on is Stephen and Philip. Okay, let's go to the next scripture. I'll try and open it up here because I got it here too. 
And they sat before them and they laid, uh, prayed and laid their hands on them. So now keep on going. It's down there somewhere. And the word of God increased. And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. How do you start? He's a waiter. Waiting on the people, helping the people. He was a waiter. And later on, it turned out great signs and wonders. I'm trying to convey this to you. That, that's you. That's you. When you see hurting people in the world, in the stores, wherever you go, here at church, extend, like Dave was saying, extend that hand. I mentioned on Friday. You know, just tell them God loves you. He cares for you. And then be ready to listen, to hear the Holy Spirit through a word of knowledge, how to pray for him. And then be ready at times to be wrong. That's not a happy thought, is it? Because like a toddler that's learning to walk, you're going to fall down. I understand you're going to fall down. I fell down. Maybe you miss it. Of course, your heart, my heart is to be right on the mark every single time. But sometimes, sometimes you get distracted or whatever, and you might miss it. Can you what? Yeah, well, there, there, there's things about to pray for that. You can ask them for, you know, or write it down, what you need and that type of thing. I'm talking more about in the spiritual side now. Now you're hearing from God. God's speaking to you about them, you know, and sometimes you're going to miss it. Be humble. Be ready to sit there and say, I'm sorry if this doesn't make sense to you. I've asked a lot of people in the prayer line, does this make sense when I'm telling you? Yeah, just uh, uh, overwhelmingly people say, yes, yes, I understand, I understand. Then there's a few of them say, ah, mm -hmm, wow, I don't get it. I don't understand that at all. You know, and, and uh, uh, I don't need to go there. I won't go any further there. So, uh, you got to be ready to make mistakes. And so, and, and the pastors here, uh, Vernon and Mary, they're here. They're ready to help you. They're here to help straighten out things. And I know you don't like to straighten out things. I have to go through that. But then that's what it takes to get you up and out, to get you up and starting to flow in those gifts. You have to learn. See, and that's what the school would also be about. And it, it's to come and to fine tune you. Hopefully you've got the basics, you know, you've got all the good teaching, and I'm not talking about just here, you do have that, but I'm talking about a lot of other places. The church is brand new, it's a brand new thought in different places. And so you, you have to have that, and then we build on that, and then we fine tune. Because we're in a battle. We're in a battle. I was, gonna, I, I was wondering how I was gonna mix this or blend it together with, because the message here, uh, Friday night it was, who are you? And the message here that I had for a title of it, you are the one. You're the one that's going to change the world. You. And you can see what God gave to you, what he, how he empowered you on Friday night. So get that. That's going to be a more, much more concise message for you to look at. But he's empowered you. And I, I was at home and I'm sitting there going, you know, uh, you know, one of the things that we really need to change in this country is the political side, the governmental side. And I said, oh, man, Lord, how am I going to do that? Because if I get off too much on that, then we're all going to be thinking governmental. No, I want you to change the world for Christ, see? And then we have the judge that came in here today. I won't go very far because this is being broadcast. He's here to change the world. He is changing his world and the part of it that he has authority of. Amen? Do you agree? You need to help him. You need to pray. You need to intercede and help him. Right? And so God just took care of that, didn't he?
I was going to try and cover that area, and I didn't know how to do it, and all of a sudden, boom, it comes in, just flows right in. So that, that's what we want to do. Okay. Um, I think, so that's the school. I'll finish up on that, and I'm going to go to Stephen and, and Philip. But that's about the school. So you'd have maybe meetings, we, you know, maybe a minimum of 12 hours per month. That's what we had in the college. And you could go for three hours on Thursday night, three on Friday night, and three on Saturday morning, th three on the Saturday afternoon. So it, that doesn't matter. That's schematics. It just, just matters that we're going to be there to teach and train. We'll be pulling. I would like, when the time comes, is to be bringing in people that are anointed in that area. Who better to teach on prophecy than a prophet? Yeah. Who better to teach the, the, the fivefold and things uh, uh, of an apostle than an apostle? And go on down the line, the pastor, the teacher, the evangelist, all of this. And, and so that's what I'd want to do, bring in the people that that's their expertise. That's what they flow in. That's in their anointing. Can I add one thing to it? Yes. Because you just take it for granted, and you don't yeah. talk about it much, so I'm going to throw it in because I, it was what I was looking for yesterday when we were talking. Uh -huh. The Scripture says that he confirms the Word Who's with signs following. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So you always have to have the Word so people don't get weird. Yeah. Yeah. But if you don't have the signs following, the Word becomes dead and stale. Yeah. Man's tradition. And the thing that Jim focuses on is the supernatural. Mm -hmm. So when he says, well, we're going to equip you, what he's saying is we're going to hands-on teach you how to operate in the supernatural. Yeah, yes. yeah, Amen. totally, totally. Thank you. Because you don't emphasize that because that's how you live. So that's, you take it That's for what I mean, yeah. You take <laughs> that's it for what I'm granted, thinking. but uh, yeah. <laughs> I want to clarify. Yeah, that's exactly what I mean. At Friday's message. You're all supposed to be walking in the supernatural, yeah. in miraculous, miracles. First of all, you are a miracle. Yeah. Amen. Creation, translating from the kingdom of darkness to his kingdom of light. Yeah. That's a miracle. So many times we think a miracle, well, somebody, you know, did this or they got healed. or We mainly think about healing. But it's not just physical healing. It's all kinds of, of healing. And it's miracles. Uh, 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 salvation is a miracle. Uh, getting filled with the Holy Spirit, speaking in tongues is supernatural. It's supernatural. It's miraculous. Getting people delivered from the power of the enemy, the devil. Flesh, flesh can't overtake the devil. He can't win the battle. You have to join with the Spirit of God, a stronger spirit, the key spirit, and the Holy Spirit. And then you take that and you kick out the devil. Right? So it's, you, you, you'll lose the battle every time. That's why I was telling, told the people up there the other time it, uh, that they don't hear this much, I'm sure. But I've told them uh, we were ministering to people that had uh, trouble or different things with uh, alcohol and drugs and different things. And that can relate to everybody in here also. But I said uh, something they probably didn't hear very often. You can't make it on your own. You can't. You try, you try to work it out in the flesh, and I'll be strong for a day, a week, a month, a year, whatever. Sooner or later, if you're just in the flesh and not the spirit, you're going to fail. So you got to hook up with God. And then so that when you're hooking up with God, now you're hooking up with the winner, the victorious, the king, the king of the universe. And when you hook up with him and join together with him, you can never lose. Right? All right, so we got to get on track with him. So that's what the school is about too, L uh, getting you to learn to hear his voice. That's key, key point. Uh, uh, anyway, so there's a lot of stuff there to, to take in, to swallow. There's a tremendous amount of things I got to pray about now. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't expecting this. What Vern said, I, I appreciate it so much. I mean, you don't know. I can't talk on it. I'm going to get misty on you. Uh, so, uh, let's go on. Uh, uh, Stephen, <laughs> how about them bears, you know? <laughs> yeah, come on. How about them Vikings? How about them Broncos? Yeah, I got to get off that track there. <clears throat> okay. So, Stephen, full of faith and power. 
He was a waiter at the, in, on the tables in the house of God. See, you serve God, you give glory to God by serving others. Remember what I said Friday? You know, not many people will see Jesus, but will they see Jesus in you? You got a hurting world out there. And, and you have, you got the answer. You got the answer. You got the message for him. Your sins are forgiven. Your debt's paid. Jesus did it for you. His blood paid for your life. His blood paid from taking you out of captivity and into freedom. His blood paid for you to be uh, lifeless and now power filled with his Holy Spirit. Romans 8, 11, that's the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells or lives in you, yeah. right? Yeah. Right, wait, come on, Lano, you hear me? Yes. Well, then act like it. Yes. I'm being blunt now, aren't I? We don't act like it. We don't act like it. I don't act like it all the time. This message is I preached Friday and then today, that's for me too, brothers and sisters. It's for me too. And that's why I believe God gave it to me so some of my crooked roads maybe will straighten up. And I'll start acting more and more and more like it. And I'm hoping, I'm praying that you'll do the same thing because this life is a test. I've said this probably every time I talk to you. Life is a test. You get 70, 80, 90, 100 years just uh, on this earth and it's just like a vapor. The, the, the Bible says it's a vapor. It's just you come and you go. It's so short of time on this earth. And what you do on this earth will determine what you do in eternity. We don't think about that. We just think, oh yeah, when we die, we go, oh, we're gonna go to heaven, we're gonna you know, sit on clouds and play harps and have a wonderful time and hallelujah, you know, and all that. No, think about it a little while, just think about it a little while. Do you think God is that unproductive that, that he's just gonna have you up there just singing? Yeah, there's gonna be times of praise, worship, singing, hallelujah, Lord, God, I made it in. That's what a lot of people are gonna say. And so, uh, what are you going to do? You haven't been taught and trained. So there, you're going to go to school up there. You're going to be taught how to flow with the Spirit of God. I can't tell you everything and all things, but I've seen some things. And there's a whole lot of schooling going up there. Why? Because we haven't been taught and trained here. We haven't learned how to flow in the Holy Spirit and to listen to him and, and to bring miracles, yeah. miracles. Casting out the devil, it says, if that happens and I by the finger of God has cast out the devil, it said, then the kingdom of God has come onto you. Yeah. We're here to bring, we're here to bring the kingdom of God on this earth. Yeah. You are, I am, they are leaders. All of you here, you're to bring the kingdom of God on this earth. Yes. Yes. Yeah, yes. yeah, I hear you, I hear you. Now I gotta see you. I gotta see action. I want you to, to, to be motivated by the Holy Spirit, not by me just yelling up here at you. I'm sorry if it sounds a little louder, but man, it just gets on the inside. I just gotta let you have it, you know? And, 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 I, and I'm believing that it's, it's, it's going and hitting you in your spirit. He yes. said, yes, Jim, I'm going to change. I'm going to do different. I'm going to pray. I'm going to seek the Lord. I, I got to know my purpose, Father. Show me their purpose. You know, if you, when you find your purpose and you know you're going that direction, then it seems like some of the gifts of the Holy Spirit start to show up. Yes. See? Because now you know... You know, and, and they are, and forgive me for saying it this way, but the gifts of the Holy Spirit are like God's tools. Yeah. Yeah. See? 
and he uses those and he puts them in the hands of believers that know how to use them. And if you don't know how to use it, it doesn't do you any good. And it certainly doesn't help the people you should be ministering to. So God gives us the tools. He's empowered us. You know, how many of you go out there with the drill, and I know they got battery ones now, but how many of you go out there with the drill and you, and you don't plug it in? How much is that juice? Is that going to, you know, how's that going to work? It doesn't. You got to be hooked up and powered in to the Holy Spirit. See? And that's what that Acts 1 uh, uh, says, 4 through 8 in there. St Jesus came back and he was telling them personally, the disciples, stay in Jerusalem until you're endured, endued with power from on high. You got to be empowered. They were the apostles now. They've been with Jesus three, three and a half years. They've seen all these things. They were sent out two by two. The 70 were sent out. They came back and, and, and they cast out devils and they healed the sick. under the old covenant. Jesus, Jesus hadn't gone to the cross yet. He hadn't gone to the cross. Jesus functioned miracles, signs, wonders under the old covenant. Now he brought in the new covenant. So we're in the new covenant now. How much more should we be doing? We have the Holy Spirit. You who are believers here this morning, I'm hoping and I'm praying all of you are, you have the Holy Spirit on the inside of you. Yes, amen. My next question is how much you got? Is your tank full, empty? Just got a squirt in there? How full is your Holy Ghost tank? Uh, and, and, and you can see it in your life. You'll see it in your actions. You'll see it in your words. You know, you got a testimony you got a testimony to tell people. You know, you got to find a way, be creative. And I mentioned this, I think, Friday night too, but there's a lot of new people here. you got, you got to find a way that God will give you creative ways that you can wiggle in to a conversation. That you can meet somebody you've never seen before in your life, and you're going this way with your grocery carts in the, in the stores or wherever, and all of a sudden... God is showing you on that person, oh man, they look depressed. They really look like they could need some help. Lord, how can I do that? How can I do that? How can I help them? <laughs> you can even crash your cart into their cart. <laughs> oh, sorry about that, you know. You know, a man in a grocery store, you can't, you know, you can't, you don't, you can't take care of those carts. And so you can crash that in there and, and just get started. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, everything okay? You okay? Oh, wow. Uh, are you okay? Can I pray for you? You might not say that right away, but you might just say, hey, is anything happening? Can I help you with anything? You got to have creative ideas how you can get there. They're all out there. You know, you can ask the whole town of Princeton and, and Cambridge and whatever to come to church, but a lot of people just won't go to church. They've had too much of the old traditional church that's no power in that church. And they don't want. You say, come on to church. Church, right away, defined. No fun. Powerless. Endless talking. Standing up. Go home. Now I'm happy. Yeah. So they don't come. They don't come. So now, you got a church. Man, I'm going through, just plowing through, ripping up the, all those things on there. You got a church here that there's miracles that happen. I would dare say there's miracles that happen, and I'm trying to alert you to that and let your eyes see what is a miracle. Salvation, being filled with the Holy Spirit, supernatural, getting delivered, yeah. cast out demons. Yeah. Miracles. Yeah. It's miracles. Yeah. I would dare say that you have miracles here in this church someplace, somewhere, every single Sunday. Yeah. Tell people about it. Tell how captives were set free. And then healing. I want to give a definition of healing too. Healing is not just physical. When I'm talking about healing here in the last two days, I'm talking about healing in Luke 4.18. Can you pull that one up? I'm, those guys are so good back there. Uh, Luke 4.18. 
This is a scripture that God gave to me a long, long time ago. This is the core scripture for whatever I do in life, ministry. Now, here's what the Lord is saying. And he said it after, I think it's Isaiah. It's, it, it, this is in Nazareth, and he spoke this out in the, in the synagogue, and boy, did he get in trouble. <laughs> but anyway, uh, and he was quoting Isaiah, out of Isaiah, and I believe it's Isaiah 60. And it says here, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives. There's a lot of Christians that are captive to preach deliverance, and the recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised. How many bruised people do we have maybe here today? How many broken hearts do we have here today? How many people that want to be a, 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 a delivered from oppression of the enemy today? You know, those nagging thoughts that keep coming back and you wanna get rid of them, you don't want. This right here is the core scripture for anything that I do. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. That's what Jesus said. And I got done reading that and reading that and I meditated on that area and that's, that's my scripture for the ministry here. New Life Ministries. And he said, why don't you put your name in there? The Spirit of the Lord is upon Jim. Is that being audacious? Is that kind of trying to lift or, uh, you know, uh, accelerate myself up above? I don't believe so. And the Spirit of the Lord is upon you. Is upon you. You. Do you believe that? Yes. There was a few brave souls. It takes something to say that, doesn't it? It's not just a flippant little saying. Because along with it becomes responsibility. Right? Yeah. Yeah, it's like dad, throw, dad throwing the keys to you. And oh, yeah, I can drive the car. Yeah, just give me the keys. I first started when I was 10 years old driving. I was on the farm, so didn't have to have a license, you know. Anyway, so yeah, I can drive that. Yeah, I don't have any problem. And then you get behind there and your feet can't even reach, you know, down to the foot pedal and the a different deal. I had to have two, two Sears catalogs to sit on. <laughs> this is no kidding. Two, and you know, those were thick buggers back in the day. Yeah, so I had to have two of those. I sat on that, and then I had to stretch out my tippy toe down there and uh, try and drive. And so, oh, yeah, I can handle that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, no, this here, the Spirit of the Lord is upon you. You. It comes with responsibility. It comes with a, lot, with a cost. There is a cost, not money, not financial. There is a cost. First of all, he wants your heart. He wants your whole heart, not half, not part time. He wants your whole heart. He wants you to spend time with him. Why? Wow. He wants you to. He wants to spend time with you. Can you think of that? The Father, Lord Jesus, Holy Spirit wants to spend time with you. And you know who sets the parameters for that? How long you spend, when you spend time with them? Yeah, you got it. We do. We do. How much time have you spent with him? Yesterday, the day before. Oh boy, on Sunday, it's an hour or two. Maybe three today. How much tomorrow? Have you got enough of God today that you don't need him tomorrow? I'm telling you, 
That's what a lot of people think. They don't say it, maybe. And of course they don't say it. Well, that'd be naughty. That wouldn't be nice to say that. Don't even think about that. But, but you, you do it. You judge it by their actions. And their actions are, oh, yeah, I got enough yesterday. I'm, just, I'm good on Monday. I can make it myself on Monday. And they, and they go into the week, and maybe pretty soon Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday comes along, and then Saturday, and then you're thinking, oh, my God, i got to spend time with God, otherwise I'll go to church, and then the pastor will see me and goes, oh, you sinner, you've not spent time with God. <laughs> so then you got to go back and try and, you know, get back in line again. Now, we should be doing every day, every day, wake up when you wake up. You know the old saying, you've heard this before, when you wake up, you don't say, yeah, or you should say, good Lord, it's morning, instead of, good Lord, it's morning again. <laughs> no, you, that's an old, old one back in the 80s. <laughs> but, but anyway, you know that one, don't you? <laughs> okay, so you have to follow after God. You have to have that heart of, of, of compassion. If you don't have it, how do you get it? If you don't have a hunger for God, how do you get it? Well, you read his word, you know, that's a common thing. You read his word, you know, how do you get it? You ask him for it. Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty simple. Yeah. Asking you shall receive, seeking you shall find, knocking the door will be open unto you. Ask him, Lord, uh, man, my heart just feels kind of like it's a little dead in that one area there. I don't have enough compassion, much hunger and passion for you. Please, would you come and help change my heart? And then you willfully say, I want, I want, you know, I'm going to change my heart. And then he, there you go. You're on the road. You're going down the road. You're getting on the way closer to him. So that's what you have to do. Man, you got to get stirred up. We're, we're, in, we're in a segment of the last days. The last days. A Friday night, I told you that God saved you. And, and he knew you before the creation of time. Remember that in 1 Peter 2, I think, 9, right in that area? He knew you before the world began. He, he was thinking about you. His mind was on you. Amen. Jeremiah, you know, said, God knew me in the womb before I was shaped and formed. Isaiah said the same thing. God knew me from the beginning. It's the same thing with you. He knew about you, you individually, every single one of you. And he designed, he created, he designed you for this day to function and work in this day. Yes. Yes. There's a lot of things changed. You know how it is with uh, 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 IT and all that type of stuff. Man, you buy a computer, nice laptop computer, you come home, take it home, and pretty soon you find out mm, you're outdated. You're too old, now you gotta be updated and you gotta get all this stuff and all that stuff. Things change, evolve so quickly. And so it's the same thing with you. You gotta be keeping in step with the Lord. You gotta be updating and keeping it you know, fresh with Him. There's new stuff out there. You gotta expand your thinking because your mind wants to put everything in a box. And, and you can't be staying in a box. If you're, gonna, if you're gonna move in the miraculous, you gotta do things that you never did before. You have to think a whole different way. You have to go in, in I think it's my, uh, Mark 9, 27. Nothing is impossible with God. Nothing is impossible with God. I went up to Canada one time and I preached those words for about five minutes. Five minutes is a long time to keep on saying nothing is impossible with God. I said it a different way, different inflection. Nothing is impossible with God. Okay, I did all that stuff. So it changed it, got a little bit of life there. But I kept on saying it. Do you know why? Do you know why? Because there was too much doubt and unbelief there. It was like a covering, just like a hard, crusty shell over it. And I had to come and take it and break it. And so I just said, nothing is impossible with God. Nothing, 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 nothing is impossible with God. Amen. What? Nothing. nothing is impossible with God. And I kept on for five minutes doing that. And it slowly it crumbled, it crumbled, it crumbled. And there we go. The doubt and unbelief 
was broken off. And then we went through and I preached uh, part of the message and we had people get healed. We had people walking out of wheelchairs. We had, at the course of that, we had about th uh, three to four days there. And then we had other places, but we had about, at that time, I think it was about 15 meetings that we had up there. And the, the man that was with me, Lloyd, he said that he counted up there and he said, we had, we had 18 people come up and take their hearing aid out and leave it here because their hearing was restored. We had people come up and, and they're getting in the prayer line and then one lady, she uh, turned around and left and I'm sitting there trying to talk to her and Lloyd went and talked to her after. He said, well, I came up in the prayer line and my healing went click like that, snap. And she said, I didn't need prayer, I was healed. So, and then they'd take out that and they'd put the, you know, uh, a lot of grandmas, granny purses and take out the hearing aid like that and put them in the purse and close it up and go sit down. Miracles. Yep. Nothing's impossible with God. And then back in the next, in the earlier chapter, in Mark, I, I, that was 1027. Then back in Mark, in verse 9, uh, the man with a demonic son came to Jesus and said, well, you cast him out, and he's thrown into the fire, and he's this way and that way, and the demon takes authority over him. Jesus told him, nothing is impossible to him that believes. See, we, we, can take, we can take that first scripture I told you about and put all the responsibility on God. Yeah, nothing's impossible with God. Boy, I can believe that, right? Amen, brother. Now, the tables are turned. Nothing is impossible to him that believes. That's you. That's you. Do you believe? That's you. And you gotta believe, nothing's impossible with God. See, so there's miracles. There's miracles gonna be taken in this place. It, I, I heard the word and I was back home. Again, I think I mentioned it Friday, but I, I heard the, the, the three words, right? miracle, healing, center. And when the miracles happen, now you got a testimony. Now you can speak. Now you can go out and tell people about miracles that happened, you know, at your church. Well, you're sick. Oh, well, let me tell you about this lady. You know, last Sunday she came in and the Lord healed her. And they say, it, it, it's going to be shocking to them. It'll be shocking to them. And you got to be able to share it. So here was Stephen. Let's get back to that. If we can go back to Acts 6 again. And here is Stephen doing miracles, full of faith and power, doing miracles and wonders among the people, right? He was a waiter in the house of God. Well, can't you do that? Yeah. yeah. Can't you do that? Let's go on to Philip. Let's go to the next one. And I think, uh, I don't have it right here, and the thing went to sleep on me. Um, it's about Philip. Go into, I think, Acts 8. Sorry for this delay here. Okay, Acts 6, 8. It says, and then, uh, you got it, stay right on there, stay right on there. In Acts 6, 8, he had it up before. Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles above the people among the people, okay? You gotta get that into your spirit. You can do this. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, Philippians 4.13. So you can do this. Yeah, and go back to Friday and listen to that video and, and that uh, it's live streaming and, and go back and see what all God has done for you and empowered you, 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 you. You are the one, that's the message. You are the one that's gonna change the world. You are the one that's got the message that they need to hear. Amen. They're craving, they desire it. They may not act like it, but down deep down on the inside, they're desiring that. They want answers to their life. You got the answers. Yeah. Amen. You got what they need. Now you gotta get out and do it. You gotta get out and do it. Action, action. Then go over to that one there, Acts 8, yep. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria. No, wait a minute, I've got to back up. Who was Philip? He was one of the waiters, right? He was one of the waiters. And so that's what he did. Same as Stephen, one of the waiters in the church. 
And then they got some persecution in the church, and then the waiters took off. <laughs> and they went out and healed and did wonders and miracles. And, and, and Philip here says he went down to Samaria. Well, you know the story. Jews weren't too happy with Samaritans, and the Samaritans didn't like the Jews, right? So he picks one of the hardest spots to go to. He didn't pick one of the friendly cities. He didn't pick, you know, one that really knew about Jesus, and now I can come and tell you the story. And yeah, he healed all kinds of people here. He uh, went to the uh, Samaria. So he went down there. Look, look and see what he did. In uh, Acts 8, uh, 6, 8. La da da, yam da shokoma. In Acts 8, verse 6. And the people with one accord gave heed unto those things when Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles he did. When did they give heed to what he was saying? When did they start to believe what he was saying was true? When the miracles came. When the miracles came, that's when they started to believe him. Ooh, did you catch that now? You can talk, 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 talk to all kinds of people, friends, all the friends, friends, family, neighbors, and, and just talk, 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 talk in its words. When are they going to give heed to it? When a family member gets sick, when a, and you go over and pray for them and they get healed. When, when you have, they have a, a, a family trouble and you come and help them. When the signs and wonders and miracles come, now it's going to connect with them and say, oh, yeah. That's right, what they said. Now I'm getting it. They saw it because of the power. And the same thing with Jesus. The same thing with Jesus. See, we have, we have a, I'm not done with Philip, but we have a Christianity. How does Christianity differ from all the other world religions? <clears throat> the major ones, you know, like the Buddhist and Hindu and Muslim and all that type of thing. How does it differ a little bit? Can you tell me one thing? There's a bunch, but. Yeah. And they look to that man, don't they? You know, Buddha, uh, Muhammad, and all that type of thing. Where are those people? Where's Muhammad, Buddha, and Confucius? Dead. They're dead. We have the only form of worship. I, I, I'm, I'm keeping away from that word religion. I don't like that word because it gets into man's traditions. But we have the only form of worship where what we worship lives in the worshiper. Yes. Yep. Ain't that something? Yep. And our God's alive. Yep. He's not dead. I don't pray to dead gods of other religions or saints or whatever. I pray to Jesus. I pray to Jesus. I just slipped that one in there if you didn't catch that. I, we pray to Jesus. We pray to Jesus. Okay, so that's the miracle power with Philip here, what he did. Because the miracles came, then they believed and took heed to his words. Right? And all the stuff that he did. And then there was, uh, for the unclean spirits, verse 7, the unclean spirits crying with a loud voice came out of many that were possessed with them, and many had take palsies, you know, that their, their arms, they had nervous problems or nerve problems with that, and they, they couldn't move their arms. And many that were lame were healed. And there was great joy in the city. I mean, they didn't have, that I know of, any newspaper back in that day. They had word of mouth. And that's how you got the news. And so people were used to uh, uh, distributing the news well, I heard this is going on in this city, and people even sat at the gate. A lot of times the, the, the culture showed that they sat at the gate, and they had people there that would tell you the news of the city, tell you news, what's going on. And, oh, what's going on back over in that town? You came from where? Oh, yeah, tell me about that. And so they had a passed down generation of news. And the same thing with the traditions of God. They did the same thing with that. They memorized, you know, any good Israelite at that time, the Jewish in the synagogue, they, they in the uh, Pharisees and things, they had to learn and memorize the first five books of the Bible, the Torah. They had to learn and memorize all of that. Man, that's a big job. 
That's a lot of, a lot of words. Anyway, so uh, now there was great joy in the city because of the miracles and the things that took place. Jesus has chosen you. I'm going to make it personally. Jesus has chosen you. He has empowered you to heal the world. Don't put any limits on it. <clears throat> I can't go there. <clears throat> oh, yeah, you can. If God tells you to go, you can. He can take you to the world. He can take you to the world. I never did imagine. I was on a farm boy, you know, at 15 years old and then up to 20, up to 30 years old. I never did imagine they'd, he'd take me around the world. Ministering to people, give, sharing my testimony, giving glory to God. I don't know what he's going to do for you or what his plan is for you. Maybe your world is Cambridge. Your world is maybe Princeton. But don't limit God in that. You know, you got, we got such a multicultural world now. You know, you got all kinds of people coming in. Immigration and legal and illegal. I'll just say it. You understand that, don't you? Okay, so you, got, you, can, you can minister. You better learn Spanish so you can minister to the, to the Hispanics that are coming. They're already here, aren't they? You know, a large majority of them. Learn Spanish. You know, start to be able to minister to them. You know, maybe, or get an interpreter so you can talk to them. Um, uh, so you need to start to expand your vision. Jesus has empowered you. I'm, I know I'm repeating this a lot, aren't I? And so I'm trying to get it to penetrate inside to your heart, going through our thick skulls, of man's tradition and all the other things we got stuck up there, getting through that so we don't sift through and say, oh yeah, but mm, I can't do that. No, get it sift through and let it go down. Maybe if I say it 10 times, it'll, it'll get through. Maybe if I say it 100 times, it'll get through. Jesus Christ has sent you. Let's go. Let's get up. Let's do. Let's be people of action. Hey. Yeah, what, what if Stephen kept on waiting on tables? No signs and wonders. What if Philip kept on waiting on tables? No signs and wonders. No joy in that city. Nobody healed a palsy in the lane. That's what you're here sent to do. Oh, I can't do that, that healing stuff. You know, that's for the, the leaders, the more spiritual. No, it's not. It's for everyone. Are you a believer? Yes. Boy, don't forget that verse, Mark 16, 17. You know what it says. Get out there. Do it. Maybe you say, well, that's brand, that's brand new for me. I haven't done this. You know, I'm up here 60, 70, 80 years old. I just want to retire and just go on home. You selfish thing, you. How can you do that? How can you say that? When God has given all, gave his son to die on the cross, not just to forgive you of your sins, to empower you to be witnesses unto all the world. Whatever part of the world it is. Come on. I'm really poking you with a stick now, aren't I? If you'd come up here and turn around, I'd give you a good kick in the pants. Spiritually. <laughs> But I just want you to know I love you. Thank you. That's why I'm here. I want to impart to you that vision for God so that you change your world. Don't leave it the same way it was. Change it. Go. Do. Pray, seek God, get training if you need training. Meditate on the word. Spend hours with God just listening. Lord, what do you have to tell me? What do you have to tell me? I'm going to pray in the spirit and then I'm just going to listen. I'm going to listen. Keep a journal, write a diary. This is what the Lord showed you. Thank you, Lord, for dreams and visions. Thank you, Lord, and Joel, it tells us about that, 228. We're going to have dreams and visions in the end days. This is the end days. Have you ever had a God dream? Yeah. God shows you something. John 16, 13, another one. I've said a lot of these things before. I, 
this is all messed up. I don't even know where to go on here now. Doesn't matter. But John 16, 13, the last phrase of that verse says, he will show you things to come. That's Jesus. He's speaking that. If you got a red letter one, it's a red letter. He will show you. Who's he? Holy Spirit. He'll show you things to come. Boy, I saw that and I go, I'd like to know the future. Would you like to know the future? In some cases, see, he only lets out the bits of knowledge that you need or you can use. And, and, and so he'll show you the future, what's taking place, what's going to take place. Now, I could tell you hundreds and thousands of times that I hooked on to that verse and I said, Lord Jesus, this is a promise. These are your words. You promised this to me to show me things to come. And he does. And he does. I don't know everything. I know some things. What is to come? Now, this last one I heard yesterday over lunch, I didn't hear about that <laughs> coming. That was a surprise. Now I got something to pray about, don't I? Now I want to do the Lord's will. I want to do the Lord's will. So anyway, so pray, you know, with me about that. And I really want to seek the Lord's will in that area. Oh, Lordy. This, I'll leave you with this a little bit, just to kind of again stir you just a little bit. But uh, the worst disease a Christian can have is the deadly virus of surrendering your will to that of an empty life of neutrality. Just wanting to get by, to settle for something without focus or commitment of doing something. If you ever reach this place, you're dying. You're not going forward. You're not going to be in neutral. You're going to be receding, retreating. You're going to be dying. And there's so many Christians at this time that are in that stage. Oh, I just want enough to get by. Let me say it again. The worst disease a Christian can have is the deadly virus of surrendering, surrendering your will to that of an empty life of neutrality. Just wanting to get by or to settle without focus or any commitment of doing something, changing something, changing your world. Your world changers. Jesus Christ has empowered you to change the world. Yeah, you're starting to get it. There's more noise now I hear. Good, good. Jesus Christ has chosen you. Don't let doubt and unbelief get in. I'm a can-do man. I'm a can-do woman. Don't give up. Persevere. Press in. Right? Right? Don't lower yourself to loser standards. Ah, right? Don't lower yourself to those loser standards of the world. This is not God's hope, not God's destiny for you. Let God raise you up to his desire and his will for you. So, if you're dead today, if you, your hope is dying on the inside, you've given up. You've lost that hope. Well, I tried, I tried, I pressed in. No, nothing ever happened. It never worked out for me. Come alive today. Yes. Come alive today if that's you. If your dreams are dead, gone, buried, let God revive them. Come alive today. Come on now. I'm looking at your faces. You got to believe it. You got to believe it. 
God's chosen you. He wants to do something miraculous through you. Hmm. Don't be dead while you're still alive. Choose to live. Choose to live. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I feel the tugging on the inside. There's a lot of you that you caught the message that it went and sunk down into your hearts. I can see there's some that had tears in their eyes because it touched them what was happening and what was taking place. How do I do that? And then there's some that the message just went right over here. Because you don't think you can do it. Maybe you don't want to do it. Maybe you got all these excuses that the devil told you. You're too young. You're too old. You're too weak. You got this problem, you got that problem, you got this one. Maybe if you'd seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, all these things would be added unto you. All the things that you want, all the things that you lack right now. Perhaps your world would change by saying yes to Jesus. I'm not talking just about salvation. If there's anybody here today that desires to get saved, they haven't been yet, that's fantastic. Normally on a Sunday morning, you don't find many of them in church, unbelievers. So, but there's you, those of you here today that just don't think you can do it. You just don't think, I can't do that. That's not me. That's not me. I can't get up and speak in front of, you know, 100 people, 1,000 people, 10,000 people. Well, maybe he didn't ask you to. Maybe he just asked you to talk to your neighbor, one person. Yeah. Can you do that? Yes. Yeah. Yes. You can do that. Everybody here can do that. Right. Now you got to have something to say, yeah. don't you? Well, tell them a testimony. Tell them of what God has done for you. Tell them what happened in Sunday in church. Tell them what you saw. Tell them what you heard. You know, the, the woman at the well, remember that in Samaria, the woman at the well? Jesus came and gave her one word of knowledge. You've had five husbands, and the one you're living with now is not your husband. She goes, oh, I see you now. Not as a Jewish man, not just as a man, but I see you as a prophet. She recognized him as a prophet, and he went on and told her later that he was the Messiah. Come see a man, she said, that told me all about my whole life. And what'd she do? She went to the city and in town from that well, and she told everybody about Jesus. The Messiah has come. Jesus went into the town. He had long lines of healing. He healed them all. And then it said in the later chapters, he said, because of the word, the testimony of the Samaritan woman at the well, he couldn't even go in some of these other cities because he'd get thronged by the multitudes. Can you share your testimony? Yeah. Tell them what Jesus did for you. Oh, I don't have anything. Oh, my Lord, you do. Saved you out of that kingdom of darkness, translated you into the kingdom of his dear son, kingdom of light. Man, start with salvation, what he's done for you there, how he's changed your life, how things have changed. I'm, I'm repeating a lot of stuff. I want it to sink in. I want it to go deep down on the inside of you. You have a testimony. Yes. Share it. Tell them. It's your story, right? Tell them what happened. It, it, it can relate to them where they're at. And you've got to be men and women of action. That's what you have to do, and that's what you have to be. Oh, Lordy, I forgot all about that.
All right. So we're going to have prayer after a while. Not right now, but we're going to have, to, we're going to have prayer. Um, I just want to let you know, I really do love you. Come on, Holy Spirit. Get him. Okay. Well, uh, last October 12th, <clears throat> I was sitting at home praying, and the Spirit of the Lord came upon me in a strong way. And I just started writing down what I heard. And so um, I'm going to tell you in just the way I received it, but this is for you and a number of you people here. So this is a declaration. Gear up. Get ready because it is time. Haggai 2.7. I don't know if you can pull that up quickly. I'll go on to the next one, come back to Haggai. I talked about Luke 10 too. The labors, the, the harvest is going to be great. Oh, I do have to tell you this illustration. Maybe you'll catch it this way. Anybody here sports fans? Yeah? Yeah. The harvest is great. And what's it say in Luke 2? Pray. Pray that the Lord would send labors into the harvest. And then my next question is, are you a laborer? Are you a laborer in this harvest? Or are you sitting by? Are you sitting at home? Okay, you know, and I'll do this quick. I'm sorry. I'll do this quick. But, you know, has anybody ever been here down to a Vikings game? Raise your hand if you've been down to a Vikings game. Have you, have you felt that atmosphere? I've been, I've been to a live game. Have you felt that atmosphere that there that's charged up? Exciting, isn't it? Man, you're sitting in the seats up there, and when they score, the Vikings score a touchdown. Now, I know the season hasn't gone the way you wanted to. I understand that. And, and thing. Well, just take a look at the Broncos, you know, the same, same old, same old going. Anyway, so when you were excited about the Vikings, and you sat in the seat, and they made a touchdown, what did you do? You stood up. You cheered. You yelled your head off. Screamed. Some people screamed. Didn't you do that? Now, what did you think about the person sitting next to you that was on their iPhone or their iPad looking at the deal and looking at here? Everybody else is jumping up and down, you know, crazy wild. We scored a touchdown. We scored a touchdown. Come on, get up. And they're just kind of sitting there doing nothing. You'd say, what are you here for? How come you're here? Give that seat to somebody else that's a fan, right? Okay. So now... Now, let's go a step further. How much more exciting would the ball game be if you were on the field playing? See, I remember way back into the days when I was a kid watching the Vikings. We were in South Dakota. That was our team. Anybody remember Fran Tarkenton? Oh, yeah. yeah, the glory days way back when. The scrambler, right? Man, that guy could get out of things, just kind of just wiggling around, going around this way and get around. Man, I loved it. Okay, what if you were on the field playing? Wow, that'd be exciting. Put on the suit. Man, the purple, the helmet. Whoa, you're out there playing. Does that sound exciting to you? Are you excited about that? Okay, here's the illustration. Right now, most of the church of God churches around, if they're saved, the people in that church, if they're believers, they're sitting in the stands. They're not part of the action down on the field. They're sitting in the stands. And they might even be like that fan that's not paying any attention and not getting up and cheering when we make a touchdown. Well, my neighbor got saved the other day. Oh, that's nice. Was he in a problem? Yeah, he had a big problem. Well, you got saved the other day. Oh, thank you, Jesus. You know, and, it, and it's like, do you know, the angels in heaven dance and shout and praise over one sinner coming to the Lord. Right? 
And now, so now you're, you're, bless God, you're in the stands. That usually means, you know, as in this uh, uh, illustration, you're in the stands, so you're saved. You're going to make it. But you're just up there cheering. Oh, that's great. I'm glad. I'm glad you can do it. But how much more do you want to be on the field? How much more exciting would your Christian life be if you were on the field? Laying hands on the sick. Raising the dead. What? Yeah. Cleanse the lepers. Raise the dead. Cast out devils. Freely you have received, now freely give. Now you're in the game. And life is not a game. You understand why I was you know, pulling a train with it. Yeah. Now you're in action. And that's what we got to see and how we got to see here with the, you, the church of God, the, and you got to get in the game. Don't be just in the stands cheering on the other people who are doing it. Get in the game. Get in the action. That's what you have to do. So anyway, um, now Haggai 2.7. God is doing a thing right now. God is shaking the nations. He's shaking the nation. I mean, literally, what happened two weeks ago or two and a half or whatever, the timing ago, and, and, and October 7th, wasn't it? Something like that. And, and now the, uh, we got a war going on. He's shaking the nations. And there's people lining up on the side of Hamas and there's people lining up on the side of Israel. The nations are being shaken. That's taking place now, and it's not done shaking. There's a whole lot of other stuff that's happening, that's transpiring. You gotta be ready. You gotta be ready. So then, then do you wanna be in the stadium cheering or on the home team, or would you rather be playing in the game? That's the question. It's your choice. See, God has already chosen you. He's waiting on you to say yes. Oh, man, I hear all kinds of excuses all the time. Well, I'm just waiting on God. I've said that too. And a lot of times, you know, I am just waiting and waiting for that open door and praying for it and that type of thing. I'm waiting on God. But you know, most of all, God's waiting on you. He's waiting on you to say, yes, I will, Lord. Then he opens the door. See? So he's waiting on you. Okay, from this day forward, this church, my people, will be known as a miracle healing center. See how that took a little while? Sunk in though, didn't it? From this day forward, this will be known as a miracle healing center. If you want to get healed, you go over there. If you want to get healed from brokenheartedness, uh, if you want to be set free as a captive, free from this and that and all the other things, if you want to get saved, filled with the Holy Spirit, if you want to be empowered by the Holy Spirit, the Lord Jesus, we believe in that stuff here. We believe in all that stuff. We believe in miracles. We believe in miracles, yeah. right? Do you? Yes. See, otherwise, otherwise, even Christianity is, is a vain philosophy. <clears throat> it just, and, and you could look out there that all the tradition that people have to follow in the form and fashion, and, and in, in 2 Timothy 3, 5, it says, uh, leave them, depart from them. Okay, and so uh, with here, with, 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 uh, a miracle center, let me say it this way, no miracles, no Jesus. No miracles, no Jesus. You're just a philosophy. You got a lot of good, good things to do, the Bible, you follow the Bible, you got all the stuff, the training and all that stuff, no miracles. No Jesus. Remember now what I include in miracles. Salvation. Healing. Deliverance. Casting out devils. Getting filled with the Holy Spirit. They're all miracles. All miracles. No miracles. No Jesus. Pretty serious, isn't it? Helps you decide what church to go to, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Lord. All right. Let's 
Start over again. Uh, do okay. Oh yeah. All right. Okay, and uh, because you have to have leaders within the church, within the church, uh, Vern and Mary. I'm just going to say this. Uh, this is the way I heard it, so I'm just going to say with it. You deal with it. But I said, from this day forward, this church, my people, will be known as a miracle healing center, healing people totally, yes. holy, all of it, not H O L L, but W H O L L Y, total person, spirit, soul, body. They will be known as the father and mother to a multi nation culture. That's what we're so diverse, even in Minnesota. <laughs> we're so diverse. Right? We got cultures and people from all over. And you don't, you don't have to go to Mexico to minister to Hispanic people. Right? You don't have to go to Arabia to minister to Muslims. Ooh, that was a big one, wasn't it? Okay. Well, follow God. Follow God. All right. Uh, and uh, because they will see our Heavenly Father, they're going to be known as Father and Mother, of that multi-nation uh, multi culture because they will see our heavenly Father's love and his miracles poured out through you, through them and through you. Yeah. That's, how he, that's how Vern knows it. Did they get it? Did they get it? I've been teaching all this, you know, the good step, you know, uh, line upon line, teaching, teaching, teaching. And the question is that, well, did they get it? Did they get it? Well, you don't know until you're put to the test. Yep. See, until that time comes up. Okay, did he get it? And of course, we know about Isaiah 6, 8. The Lord says, who shall go for us? Who shall go for us? And then Isaiah said, hear my Lord, send me. Now, don't set limits on the Lord. Don't set limits on me, saith the Lord. For I will not be put in a box that has been shaped by human hands and human minds. Even for centuries past, the religious, traditional churches have not reflected nor portrayed me, your father, as I really am. I desire, this is the Holy Spirit speaking, I desire my true self as I really am to be manifested and displayed through you. Hallelujah. Amen. Some are glad you came and others might not. I will release my miracles. See, there's, re there's a responsibility coming out here, these words. That's why I say that. There's accountability coming out through these words to you. This is just not some, some happy, clappy message. I'm challenging you. I'm doing it in love. I'm challenging you. Come on, let's go. Come on, let's join hands. Let's link together. Yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah. Now, I'm excited. All right. I will release my miracles, power, and glory through you. You are my sons and daughters, destined to do greater works, like I mentioned in John 14, 12. Jesus said, the works that I do, you'll do, and even greater works. Who's he talking about? You. He's not talking just about the 12 disciples. Look, remember, remember last Friday I taught you that? He sent out the 12, he sent out the 70, and then in Matthew 28 Mark, and Mark 16, those chapters, he sent out you. In John 17, he prayed, Father, I don't just pray for these here. That was his, his prayer that Thursday night. I don't just pray for these here, but for those also that would hear my word and believe on you. That's you. That's you. Okay. Okay, the more on the multi-nation healing center. That also could be stated as a multi-culture center. Your scope and influence will be everyone. You're not limited. Don't limit. Don't limit yourself. Don't limit God. Bluntly, a picture, a mixture of people who lived here originally, like Indians, or uh, what uh, the Canadians call First Nation. So that too, you're gonna reach out to them. And immigrants from other nations, even a trickle of Muslims, no limits. Why? Because the gospel message has no limits. 
Jesus came to save the whole world for all who will hear the gospel, repent, receive forgiveness, and believe. That's your call. That's part of your purpose. You have to find the, the individual, personal side of that, but overall, that's your calling. That's your purpose. You say you don't know it? Well, I just got done saying it. Now you gotta find what, where you fit in that. Okay, for the people that are here, Vernon and Mary, uh, speaking to them now, they need a leader. Actually, they have leaders now to affirm you're their leader. So you have a leader that's, that, that has been taught and trained. He said, okay, um, I saw Vern, I don't know if I should get into all the personal stuff and different things, but, uh, and, and the question came up, I always thought Vern was German. That's what I thought, that's what I heard anyway. And I got this while I was doing this, the Lord spoke to me and said, he's part Jewish. And I'm, I, I put a question mark in my head. I didn't know that. So I wrote that down, I asked him the other day and, and a lot of their genealogy goes back into Prussia, you know, that part of Russia before they had borders, what we know now. And part of those people were Jewish that escaped from Israel, came up there, settled up there, and part of his heritage is that way. That was news to me, but the Holy Ghost brought it up. We asked about it and go, yep. We, but I, I, I replied in this, we have Jewish blood flowing in our veins, in our heart, you know? And I humorously at times people talk to me about it and says, yeah, I got a half brother that's a Jew. I got Jewish blood in me, Jesus we're talking about now, okay? Okay, and so I saw Vern as captain of a ship. And then I heard this word, a jealous shepherd of the sheep. He loves you. He's going to protect God's people from hirelings. Yeah, bad teaching. He's going to protect you from that. And then to Vernon, you've been a teacher of God's word, equipping them on the basics and preparing them for warfare and going even deeper. One of your concerns, I mentioned this a while ago, one of your concerns is, are they listening? Will they remember when difficult, difficult times come? Time will tell, but you have been obedient to the call to teach them. And then Mary, for her, I sent this to Vernon and Mary so they can read that. But Mary has a huge, big heart of compassion coupled with patience. This did not come easily through past times of distress, abuse, heartache. You endured, matured, and excelled by God's grace and you seeking his face in the dark times. Good choice. Because you had a choice in your darkest hours of going to the dark side of tempting you to ease your pain, but instead you chose to seek God and you chose life. And that's why you're here tonight, here today, and not in the grave. Sometimes, you know, small decisions shape our whole future. All right? Patience allows the Holy Spirit time to open your eyes to see God's people as God sees them. Love, grace, and a hope for a different, better future. And they're expecting this in, in, in the, uh, to be pulled out of darkness and into his light and kingdom because you can relate to them. And that also entwines you together with your gift of compassion. Now that opens the door for miracles. You know, if you do a word study on the word compassion in the New Testament, in the Gospels, it'll be talking about Jesus had compassion on them. Over and over and over and over, it says that. What was the result? What was the result of that passion? Every single time, the result was a miracle. Let compassion well up. When you see somebody hurting, when you see somebody crippled, when you see somebody that's in darkness, you know, spiritual darkness, and you feel your heart compels you to go say something, that's the Holy Spirit touching you. How many times have you gone through the day at times and you have uh, uh, had a person on your mind, had a person on your heart, 
And, you know, and it keeps on. I go do this and I do other things. And all of a sudden, oh, man, I'm thinking about my brother so-and-so, my sister so-and-so. You know, it's very, very likely God is putting them on your heart. Stop and pray for them. Lord, what else do you have for me to say about them, right? Tonight, the Holy Spirit, today actually, the Holy Spirit is destroying all barriers of limited thinking off your spirit, soul, and body, especially your mind. Your previously limited thinking. And by the way, all of us need that done. Right? Me included. Get rid of limited thinking. Nothing is impossible with God. Nothing is impossible with God. Thank you, Lord. And I saw this other also. I had a little spot in here. I won't go into detail because I know it's getting late and things, but I saw in here also about, you know, the, the example of Elijah going and, and killing, you know, he didn't physically himself, but he had all those, what is it, 850 prophets of Baal that, that were killed and, and slaughtered that day, and Jezebel comes up with a warning and says, uh, you know, I'm going to have your head on a platter by the end of the day, and so he thought he would uh, leave. <laughs> And so he got out of town, and he started going out, and he ran and ran and ran down into the desert out there, and uh, he got under a juniper tree, tired, he laid down and sleep, and then an angel came or the, and came and shook him, tapped him on the shoulder and said, hey, he made some food for him, he ate the food, and then he went to take a nap again, and then he ate, and then the uh, angel woke him up again and said, okay, eat again because your trip is going to, you have to eat more because you got a long trip ahead. Well, it turned out to be 40 days that he went down. And by the time he walked, that's walking, 40 days down, 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 and he went down to uh, Mount Hebron. And that's it, way down now in, in, in uh, uh, Saudi Arabia, down that area. And so he went down there and he got in this cave. He's looking for shelter and he found this cave. He went in the cave and I told you this story before. And, and uh, uh, for those that weren't here. And so then uh, the wind came, the rain came, the earthquake came. And e Elijah said, and the Lord was not in those things. So a lot of times we're looking for the spectacular, for God to show up in a whirlwind, for God to show up in a fire like he led the, Is led the Israelites when they're out there. He had the fire at night and they had the cloud by day. We're looking for something spectacular from God. And Elijah said this in 2 Kings there, I think it's 19. He said, but God was not in those things. The wind, the fire, the earthquake, all those different things. The shaking things. The supernatural, you know, dramatic things. But he came to me in a what? Still, small voice. And so that is for you to learn and listen and be understanding the still, small voice of God. Too many times we're, we're waiting for the spectacular for God to show up in a chariot of fire and take me away. You know, flames of fire. But he wants to you to know his voice. Thank you, Lord. Boy, I like that. Thank you. Thank you. So now for you, I'm, I'm seeing, see you as a church are transitioning. This is I see in the spirit. You can receive it or not. Well, it's up to you, but you're transitioning in the spirit. You're transitioning into a miraculous healing Center. I call it a shift. You're shifting. Sometimes when you're shifting, you know, it takes energy. <clears throat> and there's change that's coming. A lot of people don't like change. I like the way things are. I like, and I know I can go to church and get out at 12 o'clock. <laughs> If that ever happens, <laughs> you know, they don't like change. They don't like different things. And so uh, they want to stay the same. The status quo mm -mm, ain't going to work. You're going to be dissatisfied. You're going to get irritated. You're going to cause problems 
if you don't start picking up the pace. All right, did you hear me? Yes. Yeah, so now you gotta, you gotta start picking up that pace and you gotta get, start to gird yourself, gird your loins, getting ready for a run, getting ready for a battle. Get ready, the battle's coming. The harvest is coming, you know? So, and the same thing uh, to, for this transition of a church, emerging a shifting church, God's always, already doing something more with Vern and Mary. Now, this is what I believe the Lord is saying. I let others judge it, just like a prophetic word. I let others judge it and see if it rings true in their hearts. But Vern and Mary are not just going to be moving forward like in the example of Elijah. He was called as a prophet. He said, this is not just in the pr prophetic as Elijah and Elisha were, but more so in the apostolic. They're shifting into that. They, I, I can tell you this. I know this in the spirit. They've already been moving in that. They've already been moving in that. It's just there's a transition coming in. It's going to be much, much, much more evident in the years to come. But they've, they've already been moving in that. Now, Vernon Mary, fantastic pastor, teacher. Hasn't he been teaching you such good things? Yeah. So, so <laughs> that's a funny thing to me anyway. Uh, when you eat and you've been feeding and feasting and feasting, what do you got to do? You got to get rid of it. You got to do something. You got to be people of action. You can't just sit in here and take in the good uh, word of God and then just be fat and content. Yeah, you, you just get fat. You got to get out and have some action with it, see? So that's what I'm trying to say to you too. You had that. So now that season doesn't mean it stops that season of teaching and instructing and equipping. No, it continues on. It just, you know, apostolic, it just continues on in a higher level of anointing. A higher level of even deeper revelation in things that now can be given over to you. Right? Are you catching that now? Are you understanding? Yeah, so that's what's going to be happening. It says, you have passed the test. I'm talking to Vernon Mary now. The Lord is saying, you have passed the test. I have watched you through good times and bad, and you never wavered, but kept your eyes upon me, and I have made provision for you. Yes, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Now look to the future days with anticipation and joy of fulfilled and completed destiny in him. Dream God's dreams. Dream big. Unlimited thinking. Unlimited dreams. And the Lord is speaking that not only specifically, some of those things I said were specifically for Vernon Mary, he's speaking it to you too, as the body of Christ. Don't be the walking dead, where all your dreams, visions, hopes have died, but your heart is still beating, but you're dead. Come alive today. Stand up today. Say, Lord, I will. I will do all that you've called me to do. Now, Father, I'm praying this now. It just ran right into that. Now, Father, just equip them. Equip them. Let your Holy Spirit brood over them. Lord, touch their hearts. Shape their hearts. Let their hearts not be like a rock, but let it be like softened clay that's moldable and shapeable in your hand, Lord Jesus. Touch them now, all the way through, all the way through, every single one, 
every single one. Lord, speak to them. Let your Holy Spirit speak to them, sharing with them what, a vision of what you'd want them to be doing, sharing with them the, the, the ministry and the giftings that you've given to them. Lord, they have hopes and dreams. And it's not just all natural stuff, but they have hopes and dreams that you want them to fulfill. Not just them, but you want them to fulfill. Oh, man. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Receive that now. Man, I feel, there's a whole wave of the Holy Spirit. I'm getting, I'm getting tingling all over my head and my hands. Receive it now. Receive it now. Receive it now. Thank you, Lord. Right there in your seat. Right there. Receive it now. Receive it now. Receive it now. Thank you, Lord. 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 Don't give up. Don't go home yet. In your mind, you, some of you have gone home. You're all done. Receive it. Receive it. Receive it. Thank you, Lord. 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 Glory, glory, glory. Friday, you, you heard the story about who are you, the question, who are you? Today, the message is you are the one. You're world changers. You got the same spirit in you that raised Christ from the dead. Yeah, I said that before. I'm saying it again. You got to let it sink in. Just, well, you know, instead of reading, you know, when I was a young Christian, it was like, you know, I felt like an obligation. I got I to gotta read a full chapter every day. And then it was, that wasn't enough. I got to read two. I got to read three. You know, I felt like a religious obligation. Yeah, I, I wasn't a good Christian unless I read three, four, five chapters a day. You know what? The Lord kind of matured me into an area. And he said, I can get more into you and speak to you more clearly if I tell you a verse, go to this verse, meditate, meditate, meditate on that verse all day. And he did. You just get revelation, come, just pours in. You start listening to the Holy Spirit. Well, Lord, what do you mean by this? What, what's that mean? What's this mean? And so that's what I did with those verses. Like, like, like Luke 10, 38. how God the Father anointed Jesus Christ of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power who went about doing good and healing all those who were oppressed of the devil for God was with him. He's talking about you too. Meditate on that. How God anointed you. See, you got you to know that, and you understand, in healing and salvation and all that, you didn't, you and of yourself in the natural did not heal anybody. You didn't get anybody saved. You know, you led them to the Lord. You laid hands on them and God healed them. But in essence, you're the one without you there. Jesus doesn't have the hands, the mouth, and all the other things. So you were, in essence, healers. You were helping them get saved. See? And so th that's your call. That's your mission. That's your purpose. Now find out how God can fine-tune you yeah. to get you into that so it works smooth, led by the Spirit. Okay? Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.